to us all. I mean, don't get me wrong. I stand up here every week, and at the end, I go to DM like, is that all right? <laughs> don't worry about it, Bill. You're not alone. Thank you, though, for that. Awesome. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Here we are, Sunday morning, back again in the house of the Lord, worshiping, praising, yeah. seeking His wisdom and His guidance and His leading for our lives. Yeah. Man, great day. Great day. So, and I'll tell you, you know, we've really been enjoying a lot of this time with family. You know, I mean, it's weird how, you know, as busy as Jeannie and I are, we're still kind of able to spend time with one another. I mean, it's real crazy in our house. But um, the girls, they, they, the girls are always like, getting us in, interested and involved in these old little TV shows that I would probably never take a second look at. You know, I'd be like, oh, whatever, nah, whatever. You know, and it was funny, this one they were watching, I was walking by one day, and I looked at it, I was like, oh, was that one of your Barbie movies or something like that? They're like, no, no, no. And so they kind of got me started on this. It's like a Jurassic World cartoon. What's it called? Camp Crustaceous. Camp Crustaceous. Yeah, that's it. And it's on Netflix. And, you know, like everything else on Netflix, you know, you binge it, you just can't help it. Like it's there, it's like, it's like, remember we said last week, what, better is more, more is better, right? It's kind of like the, 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 the candy, it's kind of like the cookies and stuff in your last week. Could not stop because they were there. So, you know, then you dig down on these withdrawals later, so like, now what? But anyway, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really cool. I, I, I thought it was going to get, I was like, oh, man, okay, it's one of those, great. Yeah, yeah. You know, somebody's just kind of sitting there, you think, okay, I'll just go through this, and you're like, yeah, it's great, yeah. And then you're like, oh, I can't wait for it to be over. But no, this is awesome. I love it. It's great. It's like, it's an action-packed little cartoon thing, right? Um, of course, truth be told, I'm pretty much intrigued and interested in anything that has to do with dinosaurs. I'm kind of a dino nerd without the actual facts. <laughs> I'll leave those to Ashley. She can spew those out for me, yeah. Um, but anyway, let's get to work, shall we? All right, so over the last several weeks, we've been um, looking at how God chose and continues to choose to lead his people into and through battle. Various battles of many kinds, right? And as, we, as we've discussed and seen throughout our series, sometimes God has a different way of doing things. Different than we would do them. Different than we think they should be done. And different a lot of times when we want them done. Sometimes with God, the most obvious way to win a battle may not necessarily be God's way. Sometimes the most obvious way to lose a battle seems like the way God will win one. It's the way God works. You know, God likes kind of put things upside down, doesn't he? You know, first we last, that's we first. You know, <laughs> you want to live, you got to die. <laughs> Those kinds of things. So, <clears throat> so here we are, week six of our battle plans series. You know, as fun as that cartoon is that, that I've watched with girls, I'm still not sure what the best battle plan would be if you were actually based on a battle plan. I mean, I, you know, yeah, and you see, you know, you see them they get all these things, you know, and then you see the Jurassic Park movies where they seem to kind of get past, get through those things, and that the only thing I ever heard that, that seemed like some pretty good advice was that time in the original dress board when it's like storming really bad and, and, and they're in the, the overturned Jeep and the T Rex is knocking it around, right? <laughs> you know, the apex predator that he is, he's like, Daddy's hungry. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and Dr. Grant, played by one of my faves, Sam Neill, he looks at him and says, don't move. He can't see you if you don't move. 
Now, for all my other Dino Nerd friends out there, yes, I, I'm aware that that is probably not really the case. Because <laughs> an apex predator has got to be able to hunt. And they won't rely on just one sentence. But, still, sounds like pretty good advice. Except for the fact that, in life, most times, we kind of are told or tell each other that standing still is really not an option. Right? That not moving is, is not really a good thing. I mean, often whenever we hear people talking about standing still, it's usually in a negative connotation. You know, like, in a time of rapid change, standing still is the most dangerous course of action. You know, life passing you by. Either you're growing or you're decaying. There is no middle ground. If you're standing still, you're decaying. Standing still is never a good option, especially in the ring. But not in the ring and not in life, because when you stop moving, you're done. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's easier, it's harder to hit a moving target, right? Many a false step is made by standing still. Must be one of them yogi bearerisms. It's just, you know. Standing still is the fastest way of moving backward in a rapidly changing world. Don't fear moving slowly, fear standing still. So you get my point, right? A lot of times, most times, all the time, it seems like standing still ain't the great thing, the great thing. Now, quite honestly, in some regards, I kind of agree with, with those pieces of advice and wisdom. However, I also think sometimes, and quite honestly, maybe more times than not, the best thing we can do is to stand still. So, yep, you haven't figured it out by now, because y'all are pretty smart. Y'all probably got it. I'm calling this one, stand still. Yeah, and Michelle's laughing because she's like, oh, oh, if only you would. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> For three and a half years, she's waiting for the day that I stop moving. I did once. I sat in a chair. Yep. School. Stop kidding. Well, you know what they say about the son and dog now. Never mind. Maybe not. But I'm not going to tell you about it from here. Maybe later. Anyway. <laughs> As I've been doing throughout uh, this series, I'm going to turn your attention to a particular battle from the Bible uh, for God's particular battle plan. Today we're going to be in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Now, you know, it's always interesting to me, like, when we look at, like, the books, 1 and 2 Chronicles and 1 and 2 Kings, we, we, I think we, we breeze through them because we think, oh my gosh, it's just a retelling of 1 and 2 Samuel. And... In some ways, they are all very similar, but you see, here's the thing. They come at it from a different perspective, kind of like the Gospels. You make the same stories in the Gospels, but you see a different perspective. And so I caution you against going, ah, yeah, I read this story in one of the other books. I'm going to patch it by because you might miss something. But anyway, 2 Chronicles chapter 20 talks about a specific, particular situation that Good king, and that's the other thing you find in Kings and First Second Chronicles. There's a list of kings that did right and the Lord died to you. Once the kings that weren't so hot. Right? We're going to be talking about Jehoshaphat. Good king. And I, I always wondered, like, I don't understand. And this, going back to what we're going to talk about that, I never understood why they said jump into Jehoshaphat. As we go into the story, you may see. <laughs> I'm talking about. But anyway, we're going to be in, in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. We're going to not, like, go from the beginning then. We're going to kind of hit and miss as we go in it because the point of the story that I want to make to you is that God's battle plan, once again, seems to stand in opposition to the well-intended, best uh, military 
three miles. And we'll see that, well, God still knows what he's doing. So we're going to start in uh, 2 Chronicles, chapter 20, starting verse 4. It says, Do not fear or be dismayed at this great multitude. Now, what's happened is a, 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 a massive army made up of three different nations is headed for it. And the Israelites. Now, don't get me wrong. He, unlike our friend Gideon last week, Jehoshaphat has an amazing army. So it's not like he's, you know, working with, you know, 300 guys that, you know, are used to just digging holes and, you know, plant stuff. But still, three different nations have come together against it, right? And so God tells him, he says, hey, do not fear or be dismayed at this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but... God's. Yes. Kind of what we've been talking about in this whole series, right? We have to understand whose battle it is to begin with. We have to understand that sometimes we're fighting a battle we have no business fighting. Sometimes the enemy we're facing isn't the enemy that we think it is. And so God says, tomorrow, here we go again, right? God is once again, as we see, he's giving them direction. Right? And we're going to see, just, just like the previous two weeks, previous three weeks, three, however many weeks, God is going to give them a plan, and he's going to tell them what's going to happen. He says, tomorrow, go down against them, and you will find them at the end of the battle. So he doesn't want to plan, doesn't want to find them. Doesn't say you figure it out. And he says, this battle, again, he's reminding them, this battle is not for you to fight. Take your position. Can you see him? No, not that's what shows. Open. <laughs> Take your position. Stand still. Now, and see the victory of who? Oh, On your behalf. Oh, yeah. oh Judah. Oh, Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them, and the Lord will be with you. Amen. Man, we can end it right there, because that, that in and of itself should be the entire message. And we forget that God tells us what's coming. He gives us a plan. Maybe it's only part of it. But he always tells, he always, listen to this, he always tells us the outcome. And it always ends in victory. Amen. Why? Because the cross. That's right. Yeah. God tells them what to do. He said for them to go to them. He says, that's where they're going to be. Go. Okay, they're going to be right there. Go. Told them exactly where to find the end. And it says, oh, and by the way, just because you're going there, let me explain something to you. This ain't your battle. It's not your fight. He says, stand. Still, it's almost like he's saying, hey, I just want you to witness what I'm about to do. But you can't see it from where you are. can't see it from where you are. You got to come a little closer. You got to get up in the mix. I don't want you to do anything, mind you, but you need to draw near and stand still. This 
there's a huge army made up of three different nations coming at you. And you're telling me to stand still? You lost your ever-loving life. <laughs> I mean, let's get real. Right? Sounds great. I mean, hey! What kind of jack loop strategy is that, God? Stand still. Come on, y'all know you think it. It's easy to read it from the Bible, but it's like we were talking about with Gideon last week. Put yourself in one of those guys' foot uh, shoes. Yeah, it's easy to read and go, yeah, that's right. Uh huh, I got the essay still. Awesome, woohoo! But if you're one of those guys, you gotta be going. But you see, we do that in our own life. It's easy to sit there and look at someone else's story and go, oh, yeah, yeah, you got, yeah. Stay still, you got this, stay still. But how many times we go through our own life? If I stand still, I'm never going to get well. If I stand still, how am I going to find that, that man or woman who's going to Jerry Maguire me? If I stand still, how will my business survive? How will my job prospects get any better? If I stand still, how will I ever find opportunity? Right, we just talked about it in all that long list. Of, if you're standing still, if I stand still, how will the bills get paid? If I stand still, how will I get to buy all the things I want? Pay for that new car. Get that new car. If I stand still, I could die. Every one of us at some point in our lives will experience a time when our backs are against the wall. Probably a lot of times. But I'll grant you just one. We have run out of options. We don't know what to do. All of our fail-safe responses are spent, and we are in an unknown place. We've never been here before. And our normal responses aren't working. Our backs are against the wall. We have backed up as far as we can go, and we can't go any further. But we sure as heck don't want to go to where the problem is and face it. We backed up as far as we can go, and we don't want to go to it, to them. And standing still just ain't an option. Mm -hmm. We just know we got to do something. And standing still, well, that's nothing. The circumstances you may be facing right now, where you are, in this moment, in this day, or in days later when you watch this again. Because God says, hey, go back to that message and check this out. The circumstances you're facing may change your life forever. Some things may go back to normal. Whatever that looks like, when you find it, please let me know. I've been searching for it for years. But some things may go back to normal and some may not. You don't know where to go from here. Your heart. Your mind, your life is consumed with the fear of the unknown. What can you do? God's already told us. Go to the enemy. Here's where it is. Go to the enemy. Stand still. But wait, there's more. There's always more. With God. He doesn't say stand still. He says stand still and see the salvation yeah. of the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. And you say, well, yeah, you know, 
like, well, ah, yeah, you got it all figured out, that looks great for you. And you know how I know you're saying that? Because I sit there and I watch a lot of different preachers myself. And on different things, I sit there while I'm watching, I'm going, yeah, that's a great message. I agree with that message. But here's the thing. How can you preach to my circumstances? I say your circumstances are completely different. I hear preachers, you know, talking about having faith in God when they're preaching to 5,000 people in an auditorium that they didn't pay for. And I'm like, But see, just because you don't think that someone knows your circumstances does not mean that they don't understand where you are or where you're headed. Just because the specifics may not be the same does not mean that we are not all facing the same kinds of battles. And you know how I know that? Because it's a funny thing. The Bible has all these really cool stories in it. And I'm going to say this. Jehoshaphat is not the first person that God has told him to stand still in the face of adversity. See, sometimes, sometimes we think we're in a darker place of despair than anyone around us. And for us, that is true. Believe me, there is no minimizing that. Because I've been there. And we think that when we hear messages like this, we think that's so easy for the guy on the podium to say, for the gal at the conference to, you know, a spouse, the YouTube video, the whatever. And we say, you don't know. Because some of us are facing the loss of spouses, maybe. Like my mom is right now. Some have lost parents. Some have even buried their own children. Some have been diagnosed with terminal illness. Some have families who are facing unimaginable difficulties as we speak. You see, here's the thing. It doesn't matter. Each one of us face a valley that we do not know how or if we will ever get out. And quite honest, if we're honest with ourselves when we're in those places of despair, darkness, and doubt, and fear, we're not just doubting our situation, we're doubting God. I mean, I'm not, right here, right here, transparency, honesty, I know I do. As a pastor, as your man, as somebody who studies the word, and I, I have my moments of doubt. And I don't say that because, like, I, I, I want it to seem like some kind of false humility, but I want to say that to say that, you know what? I may be a little elevated because it's better for, for the camera shot and everything, but I'm really down in the valley with y'all. And sometimes my valleys... They might not be, but to me they seem like they're deeper. Sometimes you're hurting real bad. Sometimes you're struggling and you don't know what to do. Somebody say it. So like I said a few minutes ago, Interestingly enough, Jehoshaphat was the first one God told to stand still in the face of the person. We're going to go to Exodus chapter 14 for a story y'all are familiar with. Or it should be. Again, this is one of those even people who've never read the Bible know this story because, you know, Charles Heston made a great book. Starting in 
starting in verse 10, says, As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. Yeah, we're talking about the, uh, the exodus from Egypt to the promised land. And we're at the point now where, you know, they, the people thought they were getting getting out scot free and it was going to be a leisurely stroll to the promised land. But again, <laughs> God didn't promise them that. He said, I'm going to get you out of Egypt, right? See, God never promised you it was going to be easy to get you out of your Egypt. But he did say he'd get you out of it. And Pharaoh has decided to let them go. He's like, man, because, you know, we got the agitators around him. Then, you know what? Yeah, I'm going cool, after him. I'm taking him back. I'm going to drag him back here. And we'll come back. So the people are now sitting there, and they're at the edge of the Red Sea. Hey, turn around and they see this big cloud. They know it's not the cloud of Yahweh, because he's in front of them. And they're like, uh oh. And so they do, like we all do. Again, if we're going to be honest today, I really hope we're going to be a little honest with ourselves. They do, like we all do, and they're like, why did you bring us out of this to die in the wilderness? I mean, seriously, Moses, I mean, Weren't there enough graves for us to eat them? You can just easily die there and come out here. You know, this is almost not like seeing folks go, no, you know what? There's more room out here. It's a lot of desert. So what have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen? Oh, well, we're still in Egypt. Now, what's up with all that? I'm sure God is going to laugh over that. It's, you know, hey, sitting there, you know, I was miserable back there. God, get me out, get me out, get me out. And now I'm here because you got me out. And I'm like, you know what, God, you should just love me there. But we do that. And we've talked about that a few times in this series, too. It's, it's, that, it's that uncomfortable comfort. We knew that. We don't know this. And no, I wasn't happy back there, but I'm not feeling real comfortable right in here. But at least I got used to that. So they're back up. Great sea. Pharaoh's army. Moses tells the people, don't be afraid, just stand still. And watch the Lord rescue you today. That's a light drop moment right there. Again, boom. The exact, is that not the exact same message he gives Jehoshaphat? And the people of Judah? Guess what? It's the same message he gives you and I. Stand still and let and watch the Lord rescue you. Watch the salvation of the Lord. Watch the deliverance of the Lord. Watch the victory of the Lord. It's not your battle. It was never about could they defeat Pharaoh in Egypt. If it was, it would have been there for 400 years. It was because God said, not in your time, but my time. My ways are not your ways. And we think, oh, that's not my man. Well, that just doesn't make sense. And God loves how we do that. Because, okay, you know, here comes, you know, meeting past your time. It is about you! Sorry. It's about God. It's about what He can do through you. It's about how 
we can be glorified. We've talked about that. And, we, and, we, and, and, and rather than embrace that God is still rescuing us and saving us, we like to look at it and go, God's just using me for his own plan. Remember when he tossed me catch player game? Man? Again, you can argue it that way if you want. That's just denial. And I'm not going to sit here and argue the, you know, We can have a conversation about that. But see, it's got to be a conversation, not just, you know, you want to argue for argument's sake. The bottom line is, the Bible is clear. It's not your battle. So if it's not your battle, one, you shouldn't be fighting it, and two, you can't win it. You understood that, right? You cannot win that battle because it's not your battle. Okay. It's like, I can play video games all day long, and that's great. But if I really want to, if I really step in, 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 in the, you know, octagon with McGregor and the dude he just fought, I'm not going to win that battle for McGregor. He can win it for himself. Oh, it's surprising. Anyway. It's not that battle. I can walk on any football field, any state. Well, probably not, because I think they wrestled for that. But you know what I mean? I can walk out. I cannot win those games because they're not my battle. And I can't step into your life and fight your battle. I can stand with you. I can stand beside you as we stand still and watch for the deliverance of the Lord. But I cannot fight that battle. And neither can you. That's the problem. We keep trying to fight. We keep trying to take stuff out of God's hands. And we keep trying to move. Well, you know, we're, we're, we're moving. Jab. Right? God's like, you're going to get tired. Anybody tired? Anybody tired? Yeah. Moses tells the people, the Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Now, here's the funny thing. And I didn't really know. I mean, I guess I did, but it didn't really dawn on me until I was reading someone else's, you know, take on this part of scripture. At this point, nothing's happened physically harmful to the children of Israel. They're getting worked up over the things they're just seeing as possibilities. Well, this might happen. Well, it sure looks like it's going to happen. What well, has it happened? How many times do we get worked up over the what ifs? The maybe lights. But I'm not sure. We don't see a way out. Does not mean there's not. Let me tell you, you may see trouble coming. It may possess fear. The fear may bring doubt, and even things may get worse. Man, I'm a downer today, huh? What's going on? That's why I just love that. I love you hanging right there. So, okay, we're done. You're like, wow. What do I do with that? I want you to listen. I want you to understand. I want you to embrace and grasp this. The Lord has allowed his people in this situation, and these choices that we're looking at today, to be in those dangerous situations. Not because he wants them to be harmed, but because he has a plan. And the trouble or trial that you are in the midst of right now, or maybe anything, you know what? My pastor, my mentor, Buddy Marshall, he's always saying, there are three stages in your life. You're either Coming out of the storm, 
in the middle of a storm, or you're heading into a storm. So maybe it's not there yet. Maybe it's on the horizon. But God knows you're there. And no, he didn't stop it. Yes, he still allowed it to happen. It's not because he hates you. It's not because he doesn't love you. It's not because he wants to teach you a lesson. It's because he has a plan that will bring him glory and bring you peace like you've never known. Because here's the thing. If you try to fight the battle, you're going to get tired, you're going to get worn down, you're not going to win. But if he, if you allow him to win that battle for you, there will be a peace that passes all understanding that you will never experience unless you surrender it to him. Things may get much worse for you before they get better. You may be surrounded. What can you do? The only thing you can do. Stand still and watch for the salvation of the Lord. God calls us to the edge of this stuff so we can watch His might. Not only so that we can see that the victory was never ours to begin with, but also so we can honor him by telling others what he has done for us. See, I am convinced that there are tens of thousands or millions, I don't know how many, of self-help books because there is no such thing. If there was self-help, there would be one book on the shelf and that would be it. I said the same thing about leadership lessons and all this stuff. Everybody thinks they have the answer, but the bottom line is you cannot win these battles. You cannot help yourself, except for when you submit. Stand still. You can't escape the trouble because you're surrounded. Right? Feel it. It's like, ah, can't get away. You can't defeat the enemy because you're outnumbered and overpowered. Because again, remember, you're not fighting the things of this world. It seems like it sometimes, I know. Right? I know. You know, we're talking about coronavirus and, and, and political agendas and, you know, race and 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 all the other tensions, but these are just the facades of the real battle. The real problem. And that's sin. He took the blood of a Savior to fight that battle. When you go to the left, to the right. When you have enough oomph to go forward, there's only one thing you can do. Uh, let's take Psalm 121. Where does my help come from? I lift my eyes to the hills from where does my help come from? Somebody say, stand still and look up. There you go. See, a lot of times we'll stop and we'll stand still. But you know what we end up doing? Because we're despondent, dejected, lost in love. David says, I used to have so many, I, I, I used to, uh, Business thing. You know, and she was like, what are you looking down there for? There ain't no money on the ground. Now, because everybody that you talk to is up here, right? That's where your money came from. Blocks other people. But the same thing, like, what are you looking down there for? <laughs> oh, God. Look 
to the Lord. You know, I was um, preparing for this. I had kind of interesting thought this past week. It's one of those, I wish I could remember who said it, where it came from, all that. I'm just going to attribute it to an anonymous source, and if you're that source, thank you. I appreciate it. Sorry, I don't remember you. But it said, it's not the crisis that destroys men or women. It's what we do or don't do when the crisis hits. Because see, the reality is, and sometimes, sometimes two people can face the same situation, and it one just kind of whatever, and the other is consumed by it. When he gets consumed by it, looks the other one like, oh yeah, you know, see your situation is different like mine. And the one who just kind of deflects it, looks and goes, you're just not doing the right things. There's truth to both of them, but the bottom line is, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's not even about the situation. No one can avoid a moment like this. Guess what? Like I said, you're either in one, you're coming out of one, or you're heading into one. Just saying. And if you take the time this week, you look back and you're like, yeah, you know what? That's pretty, that's a, that's a pretty profound stuff. I always wanted to be able to argue with buddy with that. I'm like, and I thought about that, I'm like, nah, yeah, no, nah, that's right. <laughs> But see, whenever you are entering into one of these, the first few moments, the first hours, the first days that your back is against the wall, the way you respond, that's when you discover what you're made of. Or rather, who made you. What do you do when your legs are made? Get the guns! Right? Oh, the army! That makes sense. Especially for the you know, of that, because Judah had a large, well trained, massive army. Which is probably like three different countries were coming out at one time. They're like, yeah, we can't take him off on one. We gotta gang up on And like we've seen throughout our series, too often we get overwhelmed. It's the first thing we start doing. Plan. No big plan. <laughs> Gotta have a plan. How am I gonna fix this? How are we gonna do this? Planning is good. But you know what I think sometimes, most times, more times than not, we neglect to do is pray. We should always pray before we plan. Prayer should be our first choice when we feel overwhelmed. Not the last resort. I'm not talking about again, prayer says, God, get me out of this. That's not, that's, no, that's not, because I'm already telling you, you probably won't. Not the way you want it to do anyway. You will, it's not the way you want it to do. Not the time you want it to do. See, the thing is, there's no problem that's too big or too small to pray about. I think, we always, you know, I, think, I think we like walk this line on our prayer, right? We'll be like, okay, I can pray for this, but this is way too big to ask God for. This, this is just, I can't ask God for that. Anyone? I mean, I don't. I've been there and it's like, man, this is just not really worth me bringing God for. Really? That's, that's pretty arrogant, don't you think? Phil? <laughs> Yes. See, we say we trust God with our eternal salvation. Yet, we don't trust Him with day to day decisions of our life. Like, what time should I get up? What should I do first? Where should I go today? Should I go here today? We just write our list of to do, right? Like, I mean, answer this, honestly. And if I see any angel, I'm like, 
I'm gonna like literally call you out in front of everybody and be like, because I know you're full. Full of it. Who actually, who actually consults God before they write up the to do list? Now, do people just not raise their hands and say, you don't want to call me out? Or do you really like not consult God? And when you're writing out things that you need to get done that day, do you sit there and go, God, what's important to you for me to take care of today? I don't. Now, guilty, right here. Because we think the plan is ours to make, and we're just going to get, and then we're going to ask God to bless our mess. Or we're going to fit him in where we can. And say, hey, God, where were you? God's like, gee, I don't know. I don't remember being invited into this plane. <laughs> oh, you won't get you were expecting to say, I am sorry. My invitation must have got lost in the mail. <laughs> exactly. Good, yeah, good. See, that's that's what it's gonna be. I'm not God. Just, yeah, I'm like, eh, that just felt bad. No, God doesn't mean that. But anyway, Joseph did something that by human standards seemed absolutely beyond belief. He called a nationwide fast and asked the people to join him in Jerusalem for a prayer meeting. He says, "Come on, do the square." We're going to do this. Now that's crazy by all human standards. His, now, truth be told, when you read it, when you read the entire story, I encourage you to do that because, like I said, we're, we're just we're having a bits and pieces of it, but I encourage you to read the entire chapter. His first reaction and response was fear. He wasn't like, you know, some, you know, oh, oh yeah, I got this right. His first response was fear. Which is a human response when your back's against the wall. However, his next response, immediately, it, was, it wasn't like days, weeks, months, years. His next response immediately was born out of a relationship with God. See, Jehoshaphat turned away from the problem and turned towards God. He was looking for a solution. He knew where the solution was. I turned my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. But you see, if we're, and this is why I know that, that a lot of us need to work harder on our relationship with God because the first thing we think about is the problem and not the solution. Again, guilty. Guilty right here. I can't speak for y'all. I am guilty of it. I spend a lot of effort and energy on that problem rather than going, okay, problem, I see you, but I'm going to go over here because I already know where the fix is. Can y'all have noticed your patch is a little bit harder? <laughs> Just a bit. I mean, you know, no more than getting. Uh, uh, he turned from the problem to the problem solver and proclaimed a prayer and a fast. Josephat is the king of Judah, one of the most powerful nations on earth at the time. And he's publicly saying, Yeah, I can't win this battle. I can't. Understand this. Acknowledging that you can't win a battle is not the same as admitting defeat. Sometimes acknowledging that you can't win the battle is where victory starts. Jehoshaphat is a king and he's looking at his people and goes, you know what? We can't win this. He goes, I'm not going to lie. We cannot win this battle. And I don't know what to do. He's telling them. 
I have no idea what to do. But then he makes the most important statement in the entire chapter, heck, probably in the entire Bible. Because he says, "What we don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Look, right here, starting in verse 9, Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord in front of the new courtyard. He's standing out front of the temple. And he's praying. He, this isn't a speech. He's not giving some kind of, you know, uh, you know, Patton-esque, you know, battle speech. He's standing there praying before the, praying to the Lord before the entire nation. And he says, Lord God of our fathers, you are you not God in the heavens. And are you not ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in your hands so that no one can stand against you. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land from your people Israel and give it to the descendants of your friend Abraham forever? They have lived in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, If disaster comes upon us, the sword or judgment or plague or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house, and we cry out to you in our distress that you will hear and save us, for we are powerless before this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. What do we do? Stand still. Stand still. Always. Joseph had dismissed his fears. Not because they weren't real. Not because he was superman. He possessed something that you and I don't possess. But because he put his trust in the living God. When we're in a tight spot, fear is a natural response. I get it. But we act in faith when we make a conscious decision not to fear. We don't let our emotions dictate our responses. When we act in faith, we turn our faces away from the problem and toward the problem solved. The Lord and His promises. If you notice there, those back. He wasn't afraid to remind God of his promise. Right? He acknowledged God as the problem solver when he was, hey, you know what, God? You did say. I think we're afraid to call God and go, hey, you promised this. We're, we're too busy going, God, please, if you, if you just only would, oh my God, you, you, rather than going, standing up, spread, proclaiming the Victories of God saying that, by the way, God, you said this victory's mine. That's right. Amen. We beg God for mercy. And, and I'm not saying that God's heart isn't broken because that comes from a place of brokenness in us. He wants us to stand up. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible does it tell us to pray on our knees with our hands holding our heads bowed? Do you know what it talks about? Lifting our hands, raising, and looking to. But we've taken this posture like, you know, like we talk about submission and surrender to the Lord, and we think that somehow that's how He wants us to pray to Him. Like, yeah, like it's, it's some kind of like, you know, I don't know, that's almost like the false humility, I think. But I think we stand out in the middle of the square and we throw our hands up and we say, hey God! <laughs> you brought our descendants out from Egypt. You did that. And you are tough enough to spark the sea so they can walk across dry land and then drown the army. So you did that for them. I'm, I'm, I'm staying here for mine. Because you said you said yes. you are my vindicator. Yes. You said you're my strong tower. Yes. You said these promises are for me. Amen. I 
be thinking, Cal Farley, like, uh oh, wait a minute. Uh oh, wait. Oh, 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 okay. I gotta fight the fight now. Gets God's adrenaline going. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I said, okay, yep, yeah, I said that. No, you're right. All right. Okay. I got this. See, when we praise and worship God, we are putting ourselves in His hands. And I'm talking about the stuff we do before I get up here to flap my gums for an hour a day. I'm talking about when we live our lives praising and worshiping God. Everything we do, we say, we are, leads and points to God. Praise and worship are critical when we find ourselves in situations that seem hopeless. And again, I think that's what we miss. We say our prayers, we go, oh, I'm just so, I'm just one. Man, let's get up and praise. Amen. Let's tell them, yeah, God, man, I'm miserable right now, but woohoo! I'm loving you. I'm looking for you. I'm seeking you because you told me. You have them. So I'm going to collect God. Don't be afraid to tell God that you're coming to get what He promised you. When we praise and worship God, we turn our faces toward Him and we set our eyes upon Him and what He can do. And here's the thing. How about we praise and worship Him not because He's taking care of your problem, but because He is your Father and deserving of your praise and worship. How about we advance the praise? Whether we're delivered from it or not. Jehoshaphat said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I can't win this battle. I don't know what I'm going to do. And he did the only thing he could do. The only thing he knew how to do. And it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't the last resort. It was out of, born out of his relationship with God. And God encourages us to do that too. Isaiah, the Lord tells Israel, put me in remembrance. Yes. Let us contend together. State your case that you may be acquitted. This is God saying, come on. Remind me. Tell me. Come on. Let's stay. You know, a couple of the verses say, let's stand in this court. Yes. And let's argue. God, it's not a bad thing. God say, remind me. I'm begging you to remind me so that I can show you that my promises are true. There was similar instructions in Hebrews. It says, let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness. Boldness. That means you walk of your God. I'm here. And I'm coming to claim what you promised me. I want the victory. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. See, with boldness, so that you may receive. I encourage you to take time to really read through that entire chapter. Read that story. Study it. Just pray on it. And see how Jehoshaphat responded. Yes, he experienced fear. Yes, you're going to experience fear in your situations. Yes, he had to swallow his pride and admit to his subjects he did not have the answer. But that's the first step toward victory for Jehoshaphat and for you. Admit, 
I don't know how I'm going to do this. And I don't mean that. I don't know how I'm going to do this, God, but you got it. <laughs> oh, I just want to... I mean, openly, you know, look, I, yeah, I'm struggling, I'm stuck. I, you know what? I can't win this, and I don't know what to do. Those best responses were that of a man walking on this earth, but he was also a man who had a relationship with God. He was a man who knew he had a God who had his back. Anybody here today know they have a God who has their back? Yes. We need to know what Joe's back do. We need to know God, personally, intimately. We need to be in a relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Tony Evans. Love that guy, man. He's awesome. But I've got a quote of his. You're in a bad accident while I was doing this, and it's perfect. Tony Evans says, sometimes you have to hit rock bottom so you can find that Jesus is the rock at the bottom.
But you have to be in agreement with God. So the standing still is standing firm in your faith in what God says he will do. When your eyes are focused on the Lord, you are looking beyond the situation to your deliverance. When we are faced with uncertainty, the first thing we must do is turn our face to the Father and say, I don't know what to do. And I'm looking to you for guidance. Somebody say it. Yes, yes, All right, so we're about to wrap this up, and all God's people are going, Amen. <laughs> it's one a little longer today, I get it, but this, I, I don't know, this is just, I, I, I don't want us to miss the importance of what God's saying to us here in, in this particular story. It's one that a lot of people overlook, again, because they don't read through this, but the bottom line is, the Bible says what? That God will what? Supply all our needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Right? He will supply. We stand still on the word by believing that what the word says. By believing what the word says. The attacks will come. And they will keep coming. Again, not, not sitting here trying to sugarcoat or, or water down anything. Again, we've talked about in this series. In this world you will have trouble. And the peace I give you isn't a peace that's going to take you out of the trouble, but give you a peace that says, God is God. He's still on the throne. And he's got this. And he knew before you that it was coming. So, if he already knew it was coming, do you not think he might? I don't know, maybe. Sort of, kind of, already had a plan in place for if you just give him the time to do it. Amen. Right. I mean, most of us here have kids. Aren't there times when we know what our kids are going to be facing? We're like, okay, you know what? I. They're just going to do what they need, but we're prepared, right, mm -hmm. to help lead them through it. You better have God. I better have God. So if we can do it, why don't we trust that he's already there? Wait. Yeah. Our Heavenly Father is with us in every fight. Every fight because he knows the battle is already won. See, he doesn't question or falter on that like we do. He already knows it's won. We're the ones that go, ah, okay, yeah, yeah, the battle of the victory is won, but man, I'm not being very victorious. If we as believers make plans on our own, well, they're destined for failure. But if God makes them, they are a guaranteed success. Where your enemies come against you, stand still. God has a plan. You may be powerless, but guess what? He's all powerful. You may be helpless, but he is a great help in a time of need. You may be fearful, but he is fearless. You may be troubled, but he is triumphant. Though you are in the midst of the storms, though you are surrounded on every side, he is telling you, be still and know that I am God. So I'm telling you, stand still and watch the Lord's victory. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we claim the victory. We claim the victory here today that you have already guaranteed and promised us. And we thank you in advance for that victory. Lord, you know the challenges we face. They are not a secret to you. They are not out of your seeing, out of your, out of your understanding. And so, Lord, today we commit those to you. We walk down to the edge. We stand in front and we stand still. And we are watching your victory. Whatever it is, in our lives today. Whatever it is for you out there today, whether you're here with us, whether you're out there watching online, 
whatever it is, be still and watch his victory. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the promise. And Lord, I, 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 I pray that you lead all of us as we're facing challenges, as we're facing trials and struggles, that we remind you of your promise to us and we claim that victory. Lord, I say today for all those facing challenges, all those facing struggles, we cannot win this fight and we do not know what to do, but we know that you can. We know that you are the victor. And so today, we commit these things to your hands. Thank you for the victory. We love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Victory. That's what the cross gives us. Right? We as his followers need to operate from a place of victory. And maybe you're here with us today. And you have never experienced that victory in your life. Maybe no one's offered it to you, or maybe you've just never taken a step and you're saying, I want that assurance. And so we're going to help you out in a little prayer. The prayer of the Savior, it's not a magic formula, it's not something that, you know, woohoo! But what it does, you will feel, woohoo! I can assure you, if you follow this, and you invite Jesus into your heart, what this does, it opens your heart so he can step in. Just say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. Take my sins. Take my brokenness. Take my hurt, my bitterness, and my pain. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Thank you, Jesus. For forgiving my sins, healing my hurts, and giving me eternal life. I want to trust and follow you. Come into my heart and my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Again, I say each week, we believe that if you said that, you've invited Jesus into your heart. You've asked him to be Lord of your life, and we want to celebrate and share that with you. Send us a message. Let us know. Yes, I committed my life to Christ today. I want to know more. And we are more than happy to walk through you with this, to lead you up, invite you in, come join us. Like I said, we got plenty of chairs, even with the distancing stuff going on and all that. We have room for you. But again, if you decide, hey, you know what, I like watching online, I'm not sure I want to go there, but I want to go somewhere else or whatever, fantastic. Come talk to me too. I know a lot of passion in the area. I'll walk you there. Well, we'll get you somewhere where you can get that. Because my goal, is not to put your name in my book, though I would love to have you here, and you're more than welcome. My goal is to make sure your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life, because that's the book that matters. And that's what God has challenged me and, and, and called me to do. So, if that's the case, like I said, you have funny ways you can reach out to us, sit us up, acfnas.org, hit the con uh, contact section, boom. We will get back to you as soon as we get your message. Have a great week. Be blessed, be a blessing, love you guys, and look forward to seeing you again real soon. God bless.